So, welcome, Sam Ruby, uh, and we're going to uh, have a in very interesting talk on the technology behind whimsy.apache.org. Hello, looks very lightly attended. <laughs> Never given a talk to this small of a room. Uh, I mean for it to be interactive, and for this small group of people, there's no reason not to just shout out and whatever throughout. Um, I typically start by trying to get audience participation, but I don't think that'll be a problem either. Um, print hello world. Anybody tell me what language that is? It's more specific. Correct. Python 3 would look like that. Language? Perl. Perl, yes. Perl typically requires the semicolon. This would work in Ruby, but um, Perl requires a semicolon, so it's more common to actually put that. This is how you would do it in Ruby. Um, scripting languages make certain things easier. Uh, anybody would recognize that immediately as, call it out. <laughs> Java. Um, in scripting languages, you typically require a, a line or two less to do common things. If you write a really huge program, it doesn't much matter which language, I mean, you, the verbosity doesn't hurt you as much, but really small things, it's really helpful to have scripting languages. And I'm focusing a lot on scaling down. A quick little demo. Oh, by the way, everything I've got, all my slides are posted on my web blog, you can click on it. Uh, slides from the Kavachi Khan talk, just Google my name and you'll find it. Go back. What I typically would do is ask for somebody who's a committer uh, in the room, who I don't know, <laughs> which is, what's your name? Sorry, I didn't hear it. D U T Z. Notice how it's quickly found, I mean, circle. Okay, you're on Flex, which is in the incubator. Well, you're in Flex and you were, this is the PMC for Flex. These are the committers. And mailing lists, reporting schedule. This is a live tool that runs on Whimsy. You see how quickly and interactively it's working. Uh, previous reports, obviously, um, Flex reports to the board. These are the quarterly reports. Being able to find them um, quickly and easily makes my job easier as a director. When I see a report, I want to be able to see the previous reports, et cetera. This, a lot of these things helped make life easier for me. My focus is on little data. There was a nice little there was a nice presentation, um, at the, very, the first keynote talked about big data and the like. Um, I'm fascinating about scaling down. Not scaling up, but scaling down. Big data that talks about transactions per second, terabytes, separation concerns, and actually terabytes, they talk about petabytes and exabytes and whatever. And they, not transaction per second, it's milliseconds and microseconds and possibly even, separate, possibly even nanoseconds. I often look at things that are transactions per day, kilobytes. When you write scripts, you often mix logic and presentation. It's perfectly OK. You don't have to do the separation of concerns, model view controller, et cetera. Though when it scales up, sometimes that's helpful, and I show how you do that. <coughs> Examples. One board report published per month. We have a board meeting once a month. It's got a whole bunch of, I mean, 50 or so um, individual reports in it. They're published once a month. I actually traversed through in the demo and actually showed the board reports for Flex. Once every three months, that is added to that page. That page is regenerated once a month because that's how often we meet. When ICLA received per day, that, that fluctuates. We can sometimes get three to five. We often skip a day or two, but we typically get on average somewhere around one ICLA per day. Everybody's a committer has submitted an ICLA. 
Once upon a time, that mostly came in via snail mail and then faxes. Now it's mostly email. Um, people sending in PDFs or JPEGs, they snapped a picture with their phone, and, and that's the ICLA. Two new P AF ASF PMCs per month. We've had three to five or sometimes, and we skip a month or two. Three invoices per month, one member meeting per year. We've got lots of things that we do that we do fairly infrequently. Diving down a little bit to the ICLA process, one of the tools that I'm not going to actually demo here, but one of the tools that the secretary uses very heavily is when an ICLA comes in, they view it. They move it from received ICLAs. They move the document from one folder in SVN to another. They add a line to ICLAs.txt. We've got a recording of all the ICLAs. <coughs> SVN commit those changes, and they send an email. Things that you would expect a script could easily do. And people often could do it with a script, right? I mean, send an email, SVN commit, move, add a line to a text. I mean, very simple scripting stuff. The reason why it's a little different You actually want to look at the ICLA and type a command. It's actually very easy in a web page to have the PDF over here and a form over here. All we really want to put in the form is typically the name and the email. Often the person who sent the ICLA is the person who signed the ICLA. So the sender's name and email is often present. So it's very easy to have a form that defaults to the name and email that you can overwrite if you need to. This is a very simple little tool used, as I said, once a day, maybe a couple times a day, that just shows the PDF on one side and the name and email on the left. And I'll show you the, te the technology I use to create tools like this. As I said, commonalities. If your scripts can easily do things like talk to SVN, LDAP, and whatever, scripts can easily produce HTML. Mostly CGI, I don't know. I mean, CGI is a technology that's been around for a long time, and most people don't really think about it that much because it's not used that often. I use it heavily. Because these things, you spin up, you run one command. If the SVN commit takes three seconds, the whole spin up of a, of a CGI that takes a fraction of a second, which for somebody who's trying to really scale, a fraction of a second, that's a lot. No. <laughs> these are little throwaway processes. Okay? That's still a lot easier than SSHing into a, into a machine and typing command and going. Some Sinatra. Sinatra is um, a low overhead thing for, for Ruby that uh, keeps the process in memory. Um, the roster tool that I was just showing you, how I typed in Christopher's name um, and, go, and the like, that I was actually using Sinatra. Mostly because it's easier. I actually want to cache some of the LDAP data to make that faster. The first tool I use is called Wonderbar. It's a tool I invented. It just basically, I factored out some stuff from a lot of scripts, and because I was using it over and over again, I just was able to pull it all together. It's on GitHub. Um, feel free to play with it. What Wonderbar does is it intercepts method calls that start with an underscore and produces HTML. BR is a tag. If it sees underscore BR, it'll produce BR slash um, with the brackets. It's, very, it's that simple. Um, this is a method call in Ruby. The reason why it's a method call is parentheses are optional. We talked about print statements. Parentheses are required in some languages and optional in others. So this is a method call with zero parameters. It calls a function which produces a PR. No big deal. Underscore P, as you would imagine, would do something similar, but notice it spits out something slightly different. The reason why is it's well aware of the rules of HTML. The way you put BR tags and the way you do paragraph tags is different. I happen to be on the HTML working group in W3C. I mean, I'm very well knowledgeable on HTML. Method calls can take parameters. H1 title will produce H1 title. OK, so that's basically a method call with one parameter. And it just took that as the text. Very, very easy. Oops, I do want to jump ahead. Not much more complicated. Script source, this. Um, Ruby has both positional parameters and named parameters. Um, so this will take a source and will produce script source equals that close script. It'll also HTML encode this, so if there's brackets and if there's square brackets and whatever, it'll put ampersand LT, et cetera. In other words, it'll take care of all the, this, the script, the HTML niceties. A couple of shortcuts. Classes are used very heavily in HTML. So a shortcut for writing class colon name, just put dot name and it'll, and it'll treat that as, 
as that. The other shortcut is if you put an exclamation point out for it, it'll be an ID instead of a class. For classes, you can put as many as you like. For ID, you really want to put one because IDs in HTML are unique. You can mix and match positional and named parameters. Though all named parameters have to go at the end. So a href link text a is what's produced from that call. Okay. The only place it really gets anywhere near complicated is if you want to nest, and that's just a do end. So a ul do end list item list item list item becomes ul list item list item list item. That's pretty straightforward. So here's a complete application. This is a complete application. If you've got a laptop, you can pull it out right now. If you've got Ruby on it, you can run it immediately. Require Wonderbar that pulls in my library. HTML do. This will be nest all the stuff in HTML. There's a style tag, a header one tag, and some logic, and I'll delve into the logic. If name is passed, do a paragraph tag with hello name. Otherwise, put out a form that's got a paragraph, please enter your name, input name, name, input type, submit. Okay, this will produce a button and an input field type name. If you actually type in a name and hit submit, it'll rerun this thing because it's, we didn't specify a different action, so it'll rerun the same page. It'll come back to this page and name will be set and it will actually say hello. So if you run this and say hello, if you type in a name Sam and run it, you'll get hello Sam. This is actually the HTML that's produced from that application if you run it without typing in a name. You notice it adds XML namespace and char sets. It, it, it inferred the title from the H1. So there are lots of little built-in niceties because I've, I've done this and used this a lot. Just made it easier for me to write small little applications that can produce all this, all nicely, neatly indented. I didn't indent this to make it look quite good for the presentation. This is actually the way it comes out. Okay, so it actually produces well-formed HTML, it's actually well-formed XHTML, uh, consistent with HTML5, et cetera. And I jumped again. again. This is what actually happens if you hit submit after having type Sam. This is actually the page that comes out. Again, all nicely, neatly indented. You don't have to worry about all that stuff. That stuff is just easily taken care of. The important thing to notice was how easily this mixes logic and presentation. That's verboten in a lot of people who build these large frameworks or whatever, but if I'm building something small that's being run a couple times a day or a month or whatever else, and I just want to blast it out, great way to get started. I can show you how to scale up, and I will show you a little bit more in a bit, but prereqs, Ruby, gem install, Wonderbar. You're up and running. Okay, so Almost everybody has got a Mac has got, already got Ruby installed. If you've got Windows, it's something you can easily download. Gem install is the command you do to install Wonderbar. At that point, if you already know how to run CGI, which many people from here from Apache might, take that script, drop it in the right directory, and it's up and running. Integration, CGI, Sinatra, and Rails. Um, I am author of a book on Rails, and it actually does work with Rails, though I don't use it much with Rails. I typically, my, most of my scripts, if you think of that scripts, the things that you run a couple times a day or something. CGI is fine if you really need to do caching. Um, another application I've got is for board meeting minutes. The board members can use that tool. Uh, they're all accessing the same data, so having that stuff in memory and fast helps. Uh, at this pace, I'm gonna finish the thing way early. AngularJS, it's a framework from Google that lets you build applications, HTML enhanced for web apps. Um, I started using it and I'm very much a fan. From the server side of the perspective, you build HTML, sometimes just fragments, style sheets, JSON, JavaScript, and images. This is what you typically do on server side anyway. In other words, you're, you're serving these things from the, the server. The important thing from AngularJS is the client. Client, model view, controller, and router. So model view controller, something a lot of people really emphasize, but this time it's on the client. And the router will route requests, pretty straightforward. Model pretty much is JSON, but can be any class. So anything that you can define as a class can be a model 
You don't have to do any special inheritance to have this work in AngularJS. You just have to create a class. This is a bit of an eye chart, I'm, and, but don't worry too much about the details. This is the JavaScript you would write to create a simple model. This is actually from deployed code. This is the model for a committer, where I actually copy from LDAP into this and return the committer. But the, the, when you actually use AngularJS, you create a factory, name a committer, function is going to actually use roster and member. Inside that function, you define another function and you return that function. It's a little bit mind-bendling at first, but it, if you're familiar with JavaScript, it's relatively straightforward. And again, this is an eye chart, but I'll show you later how I automate this. So that part will be easier. Views, templates and partials. Uh, partials is just an embedded part of, say, HTML. It might be just a div or a body or whatever. Uh, the templates can be a whole things. Filters and directives, I won't go into much detail, but they're also there. Uh, this is a template, and I'll blow up sections in a minute. Uh, H2, H1 PMCs, this is actually what's sh what I do if you bring up the PMC list from my, that application. This is the whole template. And again, it's using, underbar, it's using Wonderbar, so you see the underscore TD, this. Two major sections, I mean, it's a table with two major sections. First section is a table row. Table row, NGF, NGIF loading, do, TH loading, end. What this will do is the controller's got, a, it's got the responsibility to set a variable called loading. If that's set, this row will be emitted, and all this row will say is loading. As soon as that variable turns false, this row disappears, because it only appears if loading is set. This is all other than the fact we're using the underbar syntax. You can imagine what the HTML syntax is, greater than, less than, whatever. This is all taken care of by AngularJS. The second one is a table row ng repeat, PMC and PMCs. So again, the controller sets a variable called PMCs, which is an array. This will iterate over it, and for each PMC, it'll get the name, and it'll get the link, put that into an, an A element. All relatively straightforward, very easy to type. You can see the code, relatively easy to read. The controller is logic and scope. Again, another eye chart, and I'll show you later how it all goes away. But this is actually what you would do in AngularJS native without my value add. ASF roster controller, committer, function, it actually uses these four things. I actually do two things in this controller. This is the one where you actually type the committer's name. If there's a, in the location bar, if search has a queue, in other words, if there's a question mark, queue equals. If the URL has a queue equals after the question mark, I will put that into the search bar. So you can actually create a URL and hand it to somebody, say, here's what the search looks like. And I'll set the root scope titled ASF committers. So the, this controller is relatively simple, and I'm showing a simple one. A piece of a more complicated one, I showed you where I said loading. This is how you define a property in JavaScript in scope called loading. Enumerable and configurable is true. That's just JavaScript stuff. If you want to go into the details, that, that's built into JavaScript. It's a getter function. Return object key, scope PMCs, length equals zero. So scope PMCs is a hash equivalent. I mean, it's JavaScript. They just call it an object. If the keys of that length is zero, we probably haven't loaded it yet. So in the controller, I've got the logic to say whether or not it's loading. As soon as this evaluates to true, as soon as this evaluates to false, because it says equals zero, as soon as it evaluates to false, that row disappears. And the router, get another eye chart that will go away. Basically, what you do is you say, if the URL looks like this, use that template and that controller. Otherwise, we do it redirect to this. AngularJS, now that I've learned it and got over the learning curve, um, I'm really a fan of. However, as I said, the JavaScript to me is tedious. I mean, it's, you can look at it and say, I can kind of understand it, but it's, you got to do some mind generations to get around to it. Uh, being a fan of Ruby, I made a tool that converts Ruby to JS. This is a JavaScript statement. Anybody know what it does? Go ahead, jump out. Anybody? Well, 
If I change it slightly, now do you, can you tell me what it does? Functions in JavaScript are malleable things that can be in anything. They, can, they define scopes. They define functions. They, in this case, define a class. This defines another class, and this says that class's parent is this. Okay? This is actually valid JavaScript. A lot of people here, a lot of people code JavaScript. I mean, it's easy to do. In, the, you, in HTML, you put a little token, a little script, or whatever. You might even write little things. But very few people write classes in JavaScript. It's something that it's very handy to do if you want to build a big application. And what I said in AngularJS is you put the model view controller and you actually want to put the big application in there. But what I find is JavaScript, because it's this, here is something that's a generalized building block that could be do all sorts of things. Now reading it, it's not obvious that that's a class, makes it more difficult for me to be able to pick up that code and understand it. So I actually prefer Ruby for that reason. This is the Ruby equivalent to that. Okay. Anybody looks at that, it's actually a few characters less, big deal, but it actually, ex it actually means what it says. Here's a class, here's another class it inherits from that class. Some other differences are just differences. Both of these say, this is the Ruby, this is the JavaScript, both of them say add an item to a list unless the item's already in the list. In Ruby, add an item to the list unless the list includes the item. In JavaScript, if list.index of item equals minus one, list.push item. Okay? Ruby2.js converts this to that with no interaction. So you just, you pass it this, it passes you back that. Makes life a lot easier. Now I showed you one of my first eye chart things, which was says, here's a factory for a committer. You declare a function that declares a function that returns that function. This is the Ruby equivalent. Class committer, definitionalize LDAP, Angular copy LDAP self, and end. Okay? That's a relatively straightforward declaration of I am declaring a model that's called committer. Initializes how you declare a constructor in Ruby, and it passes an LDAP. Angular copy is a built in function because this all converts to JavaScript. And when I say it converts to JavaScript, it literally converts to that JavaScript. That JavaScript, that indented. That, it, that easy to read. The intention of this is just like my HTML stuff. It's to produce JavaScript as if it was written by a person who is knowledgeable of JavaScript, and that's how they would carefully craft it by hand. Here is a controller. A controller committers, etc. This is a little better in Ruby. Controller committers do. And here's the two statements. Added in Ruby is how you declare um, an instance variable. So this will do $scope.search. Because this is a committer, you'd use $scope. .search committer is $location.search queue. So it's pretty much the same logic, easier to declare and easier to understand. I actually showed you object-defined property loading, which declares this. And again, I'm going to show you the Ruby equivalent, where the Ruby equivalent generates exactly that, the same indentation, et cetera. I copy and paste it from the, the thing. Def loading, at PMC keys, empty. To me, it's easier to write. It's easier to read. It runs just as fast because it compiles down to the other, downloads it, and runs it in JavaScript. So it's, it's, it's a win-win all the way around. One thing I want to highlight here. As I said, the app becomes dollar scope because it's inside the context of a controller, so it's dollar scope. If it was inside, the, if it was outside of Angular JS, that would be a this or self. Um, notice I put parentheses. If you're coding Ruby, you often don't put parentheses uh, because they're optional. In JavaScript, there's a significant difference between a property and a method, and I can't, generating this code, know which one you mean unless you give me a hint if there's zero parameters. So if I said def loading open print close print, I would define a function. If I leave out the parentheses, I will define a property. Similarly, if I call keys with the parentheses, I say I'm calling a method. Without the parentheses, I'm extracting a property. 
So it's a little bit of the Java semantics is showing through, but again, the goal here is to make it easier to produce scripts that run and easier to, re I mean, easier to read and easier to write scripts. I showed you the route. Actually, the route is a lot longer because it's, it's if this, I mean, lots of when statements is what it typically is. This is only one when, so to fit on the screen. Case route provider when this, template URL, controller, else redirect to. It's a little simpler. There is a parser that I'm using that actually builds an AST tree, and it is defined, it was written by somebody else, and it is complete. So I'm doing an AST to AST transformation, and I went through every single node in the AST tree and said, from this, produce that. So I, I tried to be complete, and I will say I made an effort to be complete. The effort is still ongoing because in using it in daily th practices, you end up noticing things where there's idiosyncrasies that you didn't notice up front. So I'm still catching on. This is still in the early lives, but it's meant to be fairly complete. But again, this is for somebody who is attempting to write JavaScript using Ruby syntax. That sounds weird, but for example, if you put equals equals, I'll take that equals equals and throw it into the JavaScript. Equals equals means something different in JavaScript. Uh, you take one hash, equals another hash, it'll say false, always, unless they actually point to the same object. In Ruby, it'll actually try to see if they are the same. So you, you are aware that you're using JavaScript semantics, but what I find is when I'm building this, this is me being, when I find when I'm building this, I'm actually thinking in terms of, I'm about to make a jQuery call, or I'm actually accessing the DOM, or I'm actually accessing whatever, so I'm actually thinking in terms of that semantics. This just makes the syntax easier for me. And so it's meant to be complete. Uh, if you go to the RubyJS, you can actually click on a page that will bring you up a demo that's actually a Wonderbar <laughs> demo, but it, I mean, it actually uses Wonderbar to uh, covers. But you can actually type in any Ruby you want in this thing and hit submit, and I'll show you the JavaScript that it produces. If the Ruby is not syntactically correct, I'll get an error from the parser. As I said, I didn't write the parser. You get an error from the parser, and it'll tell you what line it is, et cetera. So it's meant to be fairly complete. I'll take bug reports, um, patches, everything. I mean, uh, it, so. But as I said, as I'm using it more and more, I'm finding out there's more and more corner areas, but I'm well past the point where most of the time I expect it to just work. I can type whatever I want, it just works. And I'm actually, the reason for this thing, I was hoping to get more people, but I'm actually encouraging more people to try it. Um, part of this, and I'm near the end of my presentation, part of this is I've got a Vagrant box. Vagrant is a tool that um, sets up a VM. Because again, this is small data. You can actually run it on your own laptop. This, the demo I actually ran on my own laptop because I didn't want to worry about having to worry about the internet. Uh, it actually isn't on the internet, but um, so if you go to the Whimsy, you can actually do the, the searches. The one change I made on my own thing was not to actually show email addresses because I didn't, didn't know who was going to be in the room. But online, you can actually look up a committer, buy email address, or actually um, see their email addresses. Again, that tool is only available to committers. But if you want, I've got instructions on how to install VirtualBox. VirtualBox runs VMs. It runs on Mac, or Windows, Linux, you name it. Um, Vagrant is a tool that helps set up a lot of pre-canned ones. Configure the virtual machine is, is one command that tells it about your network configuration. You want it to be an IP address of blah. You start the VM. I got a couple scripts that says, if you want to set up these tools, run these scripts. And it's really one or two commands each visit the URL. You are up and running with your own copy of Whimsy. And because it's Ruby instead of a compiled language, you just make a change, you hit reload, CGI just runs, and you're up and running. So trying to make it as easy, no excuse not to, for people to actually get started. And what's meant to be my last slide, so again, I'm running well fast. People can go to lunch early. A link to the roster tool. That actually is the live version of the tool I demoed. A link to Whimsy source code, Ruby 2.js and Wonderbar both are on GitHub, and there are gems you can install. AngularJS is something, as I said, I'm kind of a fan of, and you've got an introduction to. 
And this is the link to the Whimsy instructions to how to set up Vagrant to run your own tool. Questions? Marvin? So uh, what are uh, some of the things on your to-do list uh, uh, for, uh, for Whimsy? What are some of the th uh, itches which you'd like to scratch for uh, the ASF or stuff that you have left to do? Uh, I am right now rewriting the board tool the board, the, that goes through the agenda. Because I become a fan of AngularJS, the board, board, board tool's got a version that runs, um, it downloads model view controller and it's got each of the agenda items as a, as a model object, et cetera. And it actually highlights names who are on the, um, people on the call to order and there's a list of names of who are attending. It'll give you a link to those, et cetera. Uh, cross checks, all sorts of things. And that tool has actually been very helpful to infrastructure indirectly in the sense that it will identify people who put a board report saying, this project's graduated, here's the committers. It'll highlight which ones are not. The, the, the name does not match the, um, the ID or the ID is not valid. It'll actually highlight those. So I'm rewriting that. Uh, next on my list to add to that is um, action items, but that's just a, um, but in terms of the tools themselves, they are pretty much, I mean, the underlying tools that, that underneath it, I'm still tweaking them a bit, but they're pretty much ready to use and done. It's the tools on top. I'm tr what I really want to do is to make all the ASF cross checks you can think of or data at your fingertips. Um, the last presentation, Ross said, was there any um, bylaws change? You can right now do a Google search. If you Google search whimsy bylaws change, you will go to a page that will show you we considered two bylaws changes, one of which we rejected, the other one we approved, in the entire history of the foundation. My tool that just basically goes through and grabs them, grabs the individual reports, it puts it right there. Um, it's helped me in my job as a director to be actually be able to have this stuff at my fingertips. But the real question I'm trying to turn around is, what information would you like to have at your fingertips? Because it's all out there. It's not big data in the big data sense of terabytes, but it is big data in the sense that uh, she was meaning it in that sense, that it is useful information to you, uh, being able to be able to grab that. Trolling through 15 years of board reports to say which ones had bylaws changes. It's not something you're going to do very every day, but it wouldn't have been fun if you had that question asked of you. I could find an instant. That's what I'm looking for is those types of tools. So Sam, is it this need for tools to help the Apache Software Foundation run that motivated you to do the Whimsy project? Is that? Um, Semi-indirectly, I have had a lot of roles in Apache. <laughs> That's an understatement. Um, when I have those roles, it's a sort of an inherent in my own nature to help build tools that help myself. And I found as I do that, a number of these tools help other people. Um, originally, they all were running on my own machine on my own at uh, home. And I told you how Wonderbar in particular was refactored from that. Ruby 2.js came out of the, out of the um, I learned AngularJS and thought, I like AngularJS, but I don't like the JavaScript syntax. Um, but mostly this was, I wrote tools to help myself, other people could benefit from it. I mean, I was secretary for a number of years. When I handed off the secretary role, the person who got it said, do you have any tools that can help me process these PDFs? And I said, I've got a wonderful tool, but I've got no real place to host it. For a while, I tried to talk him through running it on his own Mac laptop. But he always had, SVN versions were different or something, and SVN changed the syntax of what an at sign at the end of the, of the name means, and it really, it, we always had problems. So I asked for a virtual machine. I was handed a virtual machine. I put it up there, and it's pretty much been running ever since. So, and I've been hosting other tools. At home, I got a lot more tools. Uh, I want to reboot my router at home. I've got a web page that I go to. I click a button and says reboot router. You can actually go to the router and traverse through the pages and whatnot. That's no fun. You can fetch the pages and then fetch more pages. You can write a script that does that. I wrote a script that didn't, and then I wrote a script that was a front end to it. There's a web page. Um, so, I've got a web page for my own personal finances. I've got a web page for all sorts of things I do for my own personal things. Things that benefit the ASF, I put over in Whimsy. And there's another benefit to putting it out there, which is it's got access to LDAP. So I can do things like only committers can get to this page, or only ASF members can get to this page, or only board members can get to this page. I don't think there's any one of those yet. But I could do that. We do a members election once a year. Only members can see the people who are nominated. 
I've got things that be able to say, this person's been nominated, let me tell you what committees they're on. Okay, let me tell you other information about that, that individual. Let me actually show you on the same page, here's the recommendations that that person's received. So these are little tools I wrote for myself because I, I want to do these cross checks. Um, I showed you the committer page and it showed you all sorts of things. If I go to a committee page, it loads in from about five different places information and pulls it all into one place. So, long answer to your question, but mostly I wrote it for my own personal uses and other people like it. Yes. And some of the best software I found are people, are software people that, are, that they wrote for themselves. Not because some company made them do it, but they, they did it for themselves. If there's no more questions, I guess we finish early. Thank you, everybody.